The Walking Dead has a very clear style and approach to its storytelling. Flick through any issue and you can see that it pretty much maintains it for the whole of its run. And a lot of this comes down to artist Charlie Adelard, who imbues each page with a very specific tone. I'm going to take a look through a handful of pages in issue 85 of The Walking Dead and highlight some of the work Adelard is doing with his framing, composition and lighting and what effect it has on the book, the characters and the storytelling. You're watching Strip Panel Naked, I'm Hass, and I'm going to show you some of the cool stuff lurking in the pages of some of the best comics. So probably the most noticeable thing when you pick up and read an issue of The Walking Dead is the fact it's not in colour. This was something started with the initial run of six issues with Tony Moore as artist, and Kirkman has previously said it just fits the tone better in black and white. It recalls a sense of like Night of the Living Dead being in black and white. But this is where Adelard brings in his use of lighting. In a book with a colourist, you're typically giving them room to bring in mood, emotion, more contrast. Without a colourist, you've got to make sure you're hitting that as an artist, and it's one of Adelard's strengths. In practically every page, Adelard brings a hard light into play in these scenes, and very rarely allows a soft light to exist for the whole time. And the difference between those two things is really big. With a soft light, if we're talking in real life, you take a light and you stick what is called a diffuser in front of it, and that kind of takes the harshness out of it, it kind of spreads the light more evenly. It creates a softer light across a person's face in portrait. It's similar to this face in this scene here. When you use a hard light, however, that's just the light without the diffuser pointing at your model or scene. The light is harsher and stronger, and so the shadows become much more defined. If you think of a cloudy day, how the shadows kind of just dissolve into the ground, whereas on a bright sunny day, they're very sharp and defined, and you can do shadow boxing. That's not a perfect analogy, but you can see on these two different examples that kind of effect in play. Now, with soft light, it's hard to add specific drama through lighting alone. A lot of the time, you'll just use a soft light to make things look nicer, for lack of a better term. It's naturally a more beautiful light, it doesn't exaggerate any shapes on the face, and it doesn't stand out or make a point of itself. You'll find in old movies that typically a lot of actresses were shot in a soft light. Hard light does the opposite of all of that. It's typically done for a reason, and it naturally is a great way to add drama to a scene. If you think of detective movies where they're interrogating a suspect and you've got that single hard light overhead, it's super dramatic. So you find you can start to add specific emphasis to a character, mood, or situation by changing your lighting for different moments. My favourite example of this is from Citizen Kane, which is a beautifully lit film, and one character in the background of this scene is being lit with a soft light. You can see their face is fairly flat and simple, whereas Kane in the foreground has a hard light on him. The shadow being cast by his nose is really pronounced, the shadow across his eyes is really harsh, and he looks naturally very moody. So in black and white art, you've got the opportunity to really play heavily with lighting as a way to replace the same effect that colour can give you, and Adlard really does do that. In this same scene we looked at earlier, we've got this revelation that a character knows that this man has been cheating on her. So what Adelard does in this book is use hard light for dramatic reasoning and to single out characters and moments. In the opening panel, this woman Rosita has something she's got to say, and she's thinking about it. She's hit with a hard light from the right side, which takes out her eyes and gives her, in comparison to the man in the bathroom, a very heightened look. When we see her next, it's from the other side, where the hard light is less noticeable, and she's almost exclusively hit with that straight light. Then for the close-up on her face, for the reveal, the lighting changes. Using a bit of that grey wash that you see often in these pages, you can see some of the hint of the lighting hitting her face on the right side, same direction as we've seen before, but compared to panel 1, it's so much softer. And it reveals a bit of her humanity. She doesn't have this intense light hitting her anymore, but she looks wounded now, soft, kind of hurt. The menace has been taken out of the panel. As a contrast, I've very, very crudely added this harsh light back into this panel to see the difference. And the mood and feeling changes, right? It doesn't look quite as broken, quite as emotive. There seems to be more of a sinister undertone to this version. And then you get the reaction from the man. And for the first time, he's being hit with a harder light. It makes sense in that physically he has moved out of the bathroom now and into her zone where that light is, but it makes more sense from the motion and story point of view, where it's similar to that detective analogy earlier, throwing a harsh light in someone's face as you interrogate them. That final panel now has that intense look and feel it needs for the story beat to hit as hard and well as it does. And you see this throughout, how lighting comes in for added emphasis on serious or important moments to add some kind of emotion. Near the end of the issue, we have the main character Rick visit his son Carl, who's in the makeshift hospital. The opening panel is silent, but it needs a grave feeling for the script. So Rick is being hit with this hard top light, casting shadows down his body, but more importantly it's covering his face. And that shadow across it says just as much about the scene and his emotion as the panel following it, where the light is much softer on his face. And to draw the comparison with that previous example, the soft light again is being used to show a moment of pure emotion on a character. This means something to Rick. The lighting once again changes as Rick sits down and leans into his son, telling him that it's tough being happy and optimistic without him there, and once again, Adlard chooses to reflect that sentiment of his words in the lighting choice. 
And this is not just the design of the room, this is Adlard switching up the lighting when he needs to, to create the effect. The lighting choice in that panel doesn't actually make sense physically when you see how the room is lit in all the other panels, but we don't really notice it because of the style, and because it's a comic. I think typically we give stuff like that some natural leeway because it's not real actors or a real location. And the other thing I've already mentioned a ton while discussing this hard and soft lighting is how it affects the characters' faces. And the reason for that is The Walking Dead is almost entirely composed of just faces. This is a book in which people talk to each other a lot, and emote a lot, and so it calls for a lot of faces. And this is where the comparison to Moore's original run as an artist is also kind of interesting, because in that six issue set that he drew, the look and feel of the book is actually quite different. It shows what the two separate artists bring to the work. With Moore, you had a lot of compositions that were more open. A lot of the time when characters were talking to each other, it wasn't just faces, but it was body language as well, typically from around the waist or just above the waist up. He was doing a lot with their bodies to tell who they were. Though, just as a side note, the first issue contains another great use of hard and soft light for dramatic effect, when Rick kills a zombie near the end, and suddenly a book full of soft light switches to hard, harsh lighting. Even the page background goes from white to black. Anyway, whereas Moore preferred more open compositions, Adelard likes to jam faces right up into the panels. And the difference is just more obvious, the world feels much more tightly wrapped around these characters, they feel like they've got less space to move in, and it's quite fitting for the type of story being told. Adelard puts the facial expressions to the forefront, and he keeps them toned down in comparison to Moore. Because of the wider compositions in Moore's work, and his style generally, he tended to go a bit of a cartoonier route to the faces. It's almost like theatre and film. Because of his style, he needs to go bigger so that we can read it clearer from further away. Whereas Adelard favours the close-up, so he can relax the expressions a little and still get the same feeling across. And the other thing that Adelard does differently in his compositions is, again, almost exclusively favour a head-on, eye-level shot. This is a story about regular people trapped in a world full of zombies, and while it is a horror title on one level, it's really more of a soap opera on the other level. It's a lot of interpersonal dynamics, and so keeping a camera at eye level allows us as readers to feel part of that scene. Eye level framing puts us at the same level as all the characters in the room, meaning we're seeing their faces and the scene from about the same angle we'd see it from if we were actually stood there with them. There's very few times that Adlard chooses anything particularly extreme, and when he does, they're either saved for the very heightened horror moments, or moments like this, to show a distance between characters and a panelled gridded page, we haven't got a lot of room otherwise. The eye level framing is a really, really great touch though, because it typically puts everyone on even footing. This is important when we're trying to present characters as not just black or white, good or bad. In Rick, the main character, you've got a perfect example of that. He's a character whose actions have often been misinterpreted as bad by characters in the book, and a character who feels like he's doing the right thing at heart. If Adlard starts to frame him from low angles, making him imposing for the majority of the book, as an audience you're going to start to feel a certain way about him, and Adlard would have forced that on you. By not doing that, by keeping it level, we end up having to make up our own mind. The book isn't leading us one way or the other in the art, but it's just presenting the information almost flat on the wall, asking us as readers to come to our own conclusions. And that is the real beauty of eye level work which can sometimes look drab and unexciting in comparison, but really there is a power and strength to it in storytelling. And with that heavy talking head approach, you're also dealing with a book that likes to put characters in their own panels. One panel of character A talking, next panel with character B talking, third panel back to character A replying. It's that sort of style. It's not the only way to run a dialogue scene, obviously we've talked about that in previous episodes, but it seems to be The Walking Dead's preferred method, combo of Kirkman and Adlard's aesthetic. In Moore's run, you saw more panels, because of his wider composition, that contained more than one character. He showed them inhabiting the same space. With Adlard, they all feel separated. Here's a scene from the same issue with Rick addressing a bunch of people in the area. What effect does this give you about their relationship? Do they feel like chummy friends hanging out, all on the same level? It opens with two shots of Rick by himself, then a wider shot to show where he's at, the only time Rick is composed together with these people, and he's separated because his face is hidden. The final two panels show them in direct contrast, almost in opposition. One man against all these people. It's an intentional effect that creates a divide between these two forces. And with the earlier page with Rosita, you've actually got the same thing. They rarely inhabit the same panel, and often they do just for us to get a sense of perspective, in that wide shot at the start, and then their faces exist one at a time primarily. But the mold can be broken, and there's a scene here with Maggie and Glenn. Again, this is intentional. It starts out the same, a wider shot to give us a sense of context, and then a single shot. But our characters collide after that, they come together in the same panel, and they end the scene with them hugging together. There's even a panel where they both speak with both of their faces in it. It's that same routine we've talked about before in the previous episodes, you know, if you create a visual style and language, you can also break that visual style and language when you need to for added effect and emphasis. Here's Adelard doing exactly that to show two people connecting in a world that never seems to show it. And that's the beauty of The Walking Dead all over, as far as its visual style goes. On the surface of it, it's an incredibly simple book filled with standard compositions, but that's all part of the design and style of the world. I also think it's a big part of why it's successful. 
This is a book about people being people, told in a very, very direct way, where we as readers are placed in the scene with them. We're given the chance to understand when something is particularly dramatic, when we're being given a shock moment. But we're also given the chance to see how characters engage with each other, and given moments of relief when they finally do attach to one another. It's all the staples of a good soap opera, told in a very reader-friendly way, while still giving us enough to discover and work out on our own. And so much of that comes straight down to Charlie Adlard's wonderfully stripped back storytelling. Thanks for watching. If you're a fan of Strip Pile Naked, I'd love it if you could check out the Patreon page and consider supporting. You'll get access to tons of extra annotations, articles, and interviews. For more comics talk and analysis, you can find me on Twitter at HassanOE. And finally, hit subscribe to keep up to date with all the latest episodes. And hey, we'll see you next time.